Hello, I'm going to talk about the future of work and how AI is winning at the text generation game. And importantly, I'm going to discuss GPT-3 and its implications for your job. So I'm uh, Tom Wynandy, a data scientist at Blue Granite, and either you're seeing this video through the blog post that my colleague Colby wrote, uh, in which case this is kind of talking about the future of it, of the post and what's next. But if you're coming at this just from, from the YouTube channel, then definitely click the link in the below to see more examples of text generation um, using the previous version of GPT, uh, GPT-2. So without any further ado, here I go. And what I want to talk about, uh, kind of, I want to start at the high level and discuss what GPT-3 is, and then kind of get into some use cases and how that's going to impact work. So first of all, GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained -tra pre Transformer, which is a program that's in its third edition, and it's created by the company, uh, or rather the nonprofit called OpenAI. And this is a recent development. It was just back in May of 2020 um, that they published a research article about this new algorithm that they're calling GPT-3. And what it is is that it's a pre-trained language generation model. That means they trained it on vast amounts of text data. And then, uh, so that way you don't need to train the algorithm to complete a specific task. So it's able to generate text, but without much priming about what you're wanting it to do. And I'll get more into what that means. Um, but it's really been a major development because it's bigger and better, better than anything that has come before it. So it's really an impressive accomplishment by OpenAI of what they've been able to create. And what's most impressive about it is that it's task agnostic. And that means that uh, like I was saying, it does not need to be trained to complete a specific task. Often AI is created by something that it, where it's trained to be a chatbot, or it's specifically meant to do language translation or generating articles. Um, but this is task agnostic. And so um, the next part, which is important, is that you don't need to tune it to perform whatever your specific task is. You can just give it a one shot example or a few shots example to say, hey, this is the kind of thing that I want. Um, or you don't even need it to do that. You could just say, OK, type an article for me that uh, matches this headline and subtitle, which is an example I'll give in a second. So the research article about GPT-3 came out in May, but then in the next month they started releasing it with beta testing to different users and the results they shared, it really just broke the internet. Uh, the AI Twitter sphere that I follow was just all about this and I kept seeing many examples being posted, some of which I will share now. Uh, so let's talk about one of the more impressive ones um, that comes from the paper itself. Uh, one more note about how the text generation is happening is that it's done in an autoregressive format. And that just means that it's taking the previous words and it's using a conditional probability to generate the next word. Um, or in, to put it a different way, it's only predicting the next word at a time. It looks in the past and says, given these words, what is the one next word I want to, I want to write out? And it's generating text through that iterative process. And it's very impressive, the complexity of thought um, if you can call it thought, but the complexity of writing that it's able to achieve through that autoregressive process. Uh, for example, let's talk about some priming. Uh, so in the, in the article, um, the research article, it kind of gave this example where it had primed GPT-3 with this text, which is in gray, uh, where it says the title, United Methodists Agree to Historic Split. And then it gave a subtitle um, saying that those who oppose gay marriage will form their own denomination. And then importantly, it also says article. 
indicating that it wants GPT-3 to generate an article for it. So GPT-3 does. Um, and I'm only going to read a sentence or two of this, um, yeah, for the sake of time. Uh, but I, it's a longer quote uh, and really worth reading out in its entirety. So the algorithm responded, after two days of intense debate, the United Methodist Church has agreed to a historic split, one that is expected to end in the creation of a new denomination, one that will be, quote, theologically and socially conservative, end quote, according to the Washington Post. So it's a very articulate sentence and sounds as if it's written by a human. So uh, it's an impressive feat indeed. And another application for GPT-3, uh, because it can do different kinds of text generation, is to generate code. So this is one, uh, one developer was able to kind of uh, use GPT-3 to power this interface where the user types a particular command of, uh, let's see, this is JAX text, I believe, um, but just uh, some web development, um, kind of web development command, and it'll produce that content and that code in order to, um, and then immediately render whatever that is. So it's just type, the user's only typing at a button that looks like a watermelon, and GPT-3 is able to generate code that produces a button that looks like a watermelon. So this is what I'm most excited about is the text generation uh, side of this um, for code. But there's a lot of different applications in this area, uh, not just web development, but I've seen examples on data visualization, SQL queries, uh, regex, which is a pain point for myself. Um, so it'll be exciting to see what are the, yeah, what are the, uh, other examples that they can do and how good those are. So I'll get a little more into how GPT-3 works. Uh, I said that it was a pre-trained model, but it used an impressive corpus of text. It used over a trillion words from which to train on. Uh, and part of that were two web crawlers, uh, two internet book corpora, and then all of English language Wikipedia. It was just a massive amount of text that it trained on. So it, it was, so, and the results show just kind of how natural the writing does in fact seem. And then after this pre-training, it uses transfer learning, which is how it applies uh, what it learned from uh, from kind of crawling and yeah, just uh, all the uh, input of text, um, and it's able to apply that to new settings. And so that's how it was able to read previous news articles and write uh, in a format that's similar to those articles, so that it's transferring that learning from all of that text into all of these different domains. And this is the story that's really impressive about where this future of text generation is going in AI. Uh, and this is one chart uh, that looks at the number of parameters involved in the pre-training of similar language models. And the number of parameters is just a good measure for how complex a model is. Um, and yeah, and um, we can see that just in the middle of 2018, that the models were, they had tens, or in the case of GPT-1, uh, it had over 100 million parameters, which seems like a lot until you see where it developed from there. So here I'm pointing out uh, GPT in its first iteration and then the second. And it went from 110 million parameters to 1.5 billion. So it was a, yeah, over a tenfold increase of parameters. But even then there were still some examples that were better than that, that came out with the next years. Um, so I first kind of started following text generation when BERT came out, which is a very popular one. Uh, there's a lot of other models named after Sesame Street characters for some reason. Um, but BERT was very good about being uh, kind of like coming out of a box where you could kind of take the larger model, but then pre-train it on your specific task. And it, was, it had some impressive results there. But just in the past few months, at least of this recording, uh, the size of these models has been increasing exponentially as that line has shown. 
Um, so the previous winner uh, was Turing NLG, and I'm covering up the x-axis right here, but um, uh, Turing NLG was released in January of 2020, so uh, not too long ago. And when it was released, uh, this is an uh, algorithm by Microsoft, uh, it was 17 billion parameters. So over, yeah, more than twice as large as its pre as the previous text generation model, and it just blew them all out of the park. Um, it was so massive, and this was just in January of 2020. But now we need to see where GPT-3 compares with all of these. Did it still follow that exponential growth? And it did. So previously, Turing NLG was up in that top right-hand corner, but now at 17 billion parameters, it's low on the chart. And remember that it was just May that GPT-3 came out. So the previous largest model was 17 billion and GPT-3 went to 175 billion parameters. It's, it's over a tenfold increase and it's just so large, so large. And what's most impressive for this um, is that we would expect some kind of diminishing returns after this, that we would think, okay, you can only make a text generation model so large before it doesn't become relevant anymore, or it stops getting better after a certain size. But we haven't seen that yet. So we still don't know what the upper limits for these models are. So I think it's just only a matter of time before a better one replaces GPT-3. And yeah, and they'll, they'll just keep, keep improving. So here's the future of GPT-3. Um, so far, more pre-training is yielding better models, as I said. And with that, there's no end in sight. Right now, the constraints on, on creating larger models come in from being able, to, uh, being able to have enough training data to use because there's only so much text that's easily available on the internet to scrape and use. Um, but also there's economic constraints. So GPT-3 took uh, 10 to the 23 flops to train, which cost, uh, people are estimating, this This isn't widely known, um, so I can't confirm it, but it's estimated that GPT-3 took $12 million to train, which that's that's an expensive algorithm. Um, so there are there are economic constraints that are very real in this, in this area. Uh, and where I see this going, um, again, I think there's going to be rapid development in the next few years in the same way that how um, computer vision improved an impressive amount in the past five years. I think we're going to see text generation really take center stage in this area. Uh, but GPT-3 is not available yet to the broad public, at least as of uh, mid-August that this video is made. Um, and they are going to release it, uh, their, their website says soon, through an API, but it'll cost something, it'll be for a price. Um, even Turing NLG isn't uh, completely available to the public either. So there's a lag in making these making these available for people to use. So if you have read the blog post that my colleague, uh, Dr. Colby Ford wrote, um, uh, that used text generation, um, he trained that on GPT-2. So everything that was made was with GPT-2, the previous version. And even with that, it was still very good. So uh, I look forward to what we can do uh, at Blue Granite next for using the, th the third iteration of GPT-3. And now getting to the questions of how this is going to take over your job. Um, so what are the limitations of GPT-3? And the first of which is that the examples that I've shown, um, they really seem like there's a lot of selection bias going on, which means that only the best examples are being shared online. And of those, only the best of the best are sh even are retweeted a lot and shared more broadly. So we're only seeing the cream of the crop, and it's not necessarily a random sample of what GPT-3 is capable of. So we're seeing in its best light not necessarily what the typical uh, response is giving. And um, yeah, and the next thing is that uh, I don't think GPT-3 is going to be taking over jobs, um, at least for jobs that are involving more skill. 
Um, and this is this is a unique question to me um, since I'm an economist by training. So, um, but what I see is that um, AI broadly is augmenting skilled labor, not necessarily uh, replacing skilled labor. And to which I welcome. Um, I think we're going to see AI and uh, GPT-3 or whatever number we're on kind of become something like Clippy, where our own work is being augmented by AI, where it's being able to create create some base tasks um, that then we edit down and improve. And that's what I would really like, actually. Um, I would love for some text generation model to write a blog post for me that then I can edit down to exactly what I want. I would love AI to be able to build me a website um, if I just type a few commands and then I can fine tune it to exactly what I want. And I would love some text generation to write chunks of code for me that then I can like modify to complete the task that I'm specifically looking for it to do. And overall, um, I think it was put best by uh, one user on Twitter uh, who says, to replace programmers with GPT-3, clients would have to accurately describe what they want. We're safe. So this is saying that there is still a purpose uh, for humans. We're not going to lose our jobs over this, um, but it might change our jobs and it might change our day-to-day -day work. And I'll just leave you with one final example. Um, someone asked GPT-3, uh, let's see, they wrote the black text, the bold, or the bold text rather, saying if MC Hammer would run for president of the US, this would be his election program. And then they uh, wrote to the number one to show that it's an enumerated list. And GPT-3 wrote down M MC Hammer's uh, presidential yeah, program. Uh, saying that he would make the nation's laws with rhymes, not with money and lobbyism, and he would build everywhere and all over America roads asphalted, clean, safe, and good only with hammer. Um, and it goes on with, <laughs> with a very transportation and rhyme-centered uh, political platform. Um, so with this, we can we can see it's not perfectly human. Uh, it doesn't sound like yeah, like if I would make some comical list like this. But it's still pretty good. So there's there's limitations, um, but it's but I'm more impressed uh, by what GPT-3 can do than I am uh, surprised about what it can't. Uh, so with that, uh, yeah, feel free to uh, click the blog post in the link below. And thank you for watching. All right, have a great day.